just need to come into the sanctuary and let's get started on worship this morning. Is everybody um, ready to stand? If you are able, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that we are here together. We praise you for this amazing time where we can come and worship you in spirit and in truth and support each other and look to you. We just ask Holy Spirit that you come now and fill this place with your presence. And just like the upper room, Lord Jesus, we do long for a move of your Holy Spirit in us. We come to you, we humble ourselves and lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. So we do, we lift him up. There's a scripture that um, dad actually used a couple months ago that I really liked. 2 Timothy 2, 11. The saying is trustworthy for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And it seems almost like a counterintuitive thing that it says that even if we're faithless he is faithful but that's such a promise to us that because of his nature he will always be faithful to us so let's sing today Oh, we look to you right now. We ask. 
times that God has been faithful to you. Hallelujah, Lord. You pursue your children, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. And normally, normally, this would be a time to shake hands and hug and greet. Don't do that. <laughs> Wherever you are, whether you're here or you're watching, just look at the people around you and give them a great big smile and tell them that God loves them and you love them too. Okay, give you time to do that. Anybody doing that? Some people are doing that. That's great. Well, it's good to have everybody here, wherever you are, in whichever uh, place, whether uh, you're here or in the other building, watching on the screen, or you're watching from home, uh, great to be together as much as we can, uh, at Bethany Church family and others that are watching from down south, we say hi to you too. Uh, some folks down south uh, that uh, attended the church a long time ago let us know that they're watching, watching uh, faithfully, uh, John and Phyllis Strobel, if you're watching this, God bless you, hi, in Salmon Arm, and it's, you know, have a great day, okay, okay, um, just a few announcements, I want to give some announcements here, uh, you need to register for services if you want to come for services, uh, those people that are here, you've already registered, uh, this is first class, second class in the other room, <laughs> Um, but there's nothing really, you know, special about first class as far as drinks and things like that. We, we just, uh, uh, you're more present here. And then in the second room, we can watch on the screen. And uh, if you want a fellowship in, to some degree, you need to register for that. Get on the planning center or give Judy a call at the office and let her know. And we'll get you in. Life groups are also starting again. And please see Pastor Ben about that. Find out which life group you're a part of. Maybe you're already a part of a life group and you just need to contact your leader and find out what's up. And we'll be meeting, a lot of our groups are going to be meeting right here in the church building because we can meet up to 50 people in the church building. And so uh, there's a little more freedom when we do that. So contact Pastor Ben or get a hold of Pastor Ben at BethanyChurch.ca. Also, Friday ministries are starting. And the Girls Club has started with a bang. I understand that they're going great guns. Uh, girls Club on Friday night at 7.30. And so uh, let us know that you're coming. You've got a girl that's coming. We can't pick up. Unfortunately, we can't do van pickups. So there's no rides that can be provided. So parents, you have to get your children to Girls Club and also youth group at 7 o'clock on Friday nights. And see Pastor Ben about that, about details about that, and register at bethanychurch.ca events on your planning center. So those are starting. Boys Club has not started yet, and we're working on that. That's all I can say is we're working on that. Then we have a woodcutting work bee coming up in October, the weekend, Saturday, after Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is coming soon. And I'm sure that everybody's got great family plans for that. The weekend after that, on Saturday, we have a woodcutting work bee at Camp Yukon. Please register for that if you're wanting to come and get involved with the woodcutting. Always a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. So register for that. Also, I'll mention that we are continuing with a text of prayer to a prayer line. And if you phone 336-PRAY, that's 336 pray, P-R-A-Y, pray, then you can text in to our prayer chain and to our prayer people. We have a prayer team in the church. We'd like to pray for anything that's happening in your family. You need prayer. Let us know that you need prayer. We'd love to pray with you. And um, you can also phone in if you need to and let us know if, if there's any real special prayer. There's been a lot of things that We've been having to lift up to the Lord in prayer at this time, and we've seen God move in and do great things, do real miracles 
we believe in prayer. Amen? Yes. So we keep praying. Now, giving. I just want to say something about giving. Well, Tommy Barnett, who was the pastor of the Phoenix Church, great church in Phoenix for many years, and is still involved with that, although Tommy is now 81 years old. Uh, but, huh? 83. 83 years old. Okay, he doesn't seem like 83 years old. If you ever see Tommy Barnett preaching, he's, he's, he's a real live wire, but he pastored a church in Phoenix, and he used to talk a lot about the miracle in the house. In fact, he wrote a book called The Miracle in the House. And what that was about was the aspect of expecting God for things that you need or expecting God for a miracle that you need. And many times we're up against problems or we have situations where we need God's supply and we have need. And we pray and we hold before God the promises of God that if we will tithe faithfully that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And we see, I think many times we think in our minds, we, we just can picture that there's some big windows up in heaven there and they get opened up and all of a sudden <laughs> these blessings come pouring down into our house and all of a sudden there's money all over the floor. And uh, it's kind of like we have a, the aspect of the blessings of God are always like manna, where God supplies manna and food every day and we just go up and pick it up. Just, and there it is. And God does do that sometimes, but sometimes God does something else and that he expects some faith for us to believe him and step out in faith. And that's where many times, we see many stories in the Bible like the little boy with the fishes and loaves and when he gave them to Jesus. And Jesus said, what have you got to the crowd? And they said, well, we, we got nothing except this little kid here, he's got a, he's got a nice lunch from his mom. He says, well, let's take the lunch. <laughs> and so you get the boy's permission first of all. The boy says, yeah, you can have my lunch. And that lunch multiplied and fed the multitude. Well, also we see a story in 1 Kings in the Bible. We see the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. And what happened was uh, Elijah was basically uh, exiled from his own people because of a prophecy that he had given. And he was just living on what God brought to him. And at first he was fed by ravens, which was a miracle. Uh, usually ravens aren't feeding us. <laughs> Have you noticed that in the Yukon? Um, no. If a Yukon comes, if, if, if a raven comes and drops something at your feet, don't eat it. <laughs> Unless you've really got close instructions from God on this. But he was fed by ravens. And then God says, I want you to go to a little town in Zarephath, and there's a widow who's going to feed you. I've instructed her to give you something to eat. That's really interesting that God had said, I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So God had spoken to this woman. But when Elijah came along and said, hey, I need something to eat, she said to Elijah, she says, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and then die. Hmm. Wow, that's faith. You know, this is the last meal. The whole family's going to die. Hmm. Well, at that point, she didn't seem to have a whole lot of faith stirring up in her heart. But Elijah said to her, he says, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me first and then make something for yourself and for your son. I don't know if you're hearing me right, Elijah, but I don't have enough for you and my, me and my son. Me and my son got enough, just enough to eat a little bit and then die. And he's not hearing her. And he's saying, no, you gotta feed me first. Sounds really selfish, doesn't it? But really what he's doing is he's saying, Give unto the Lord first and see what happens. So she had to express some faith. She had to step out in faith. And this is what Elijah said. And I'm sure that when Elijah spoke, that faith stirred up in her heart. Because he said this, For the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry. And so she went out in faith, said, Okay, 
I believe the word of God from this man. I believe it's the Lord. And something in her heart and her spirit said, this is the Lord. And she went out and she, she got her food. She put it together and she gave it to Elijah first. And guess what happened? It says, for the word of God came true and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. And as long as she kept going to the cupboard, it, the supply was there. And I just really believe that God is many times saying to us, mm -hmm. when we ask him to supply us for something, he says, what have you got in your house? What have you got in your hand? Step on faith mm -hmm. first with that mm -hmm. and give on to the Lord yes. and see if I will not pour out for a blessing. I'll supply for you. I'll look after you. Many times we think, I can't do anything more for the Lord, mm -hmm. whether it's time or money or energy. Because I, all I've got is just enough for myself. God says, no. He says, Step yeah. out of faith. And use it for the Lord. And see if God will not supply. And strengthen you. And supply for you. Yeah. What have you got in your hand? What have you got in your house? Yeah. The Lord would challenge us this morning. Amen? Amen. Um, okay, there's an offering plate at the back. But otherwise, everybody give on Planning Center. And... Um, you can give on our website. There are many ways to give. You just check on our website. There's a little offering plate at the back here for others. And uh, let's just pray for a moment, and then we'll go back to worship. Lord, we just thank you for your supply. We thank you, yes, Lord, that Lord. you're a God that challenges us, Lord. What have you got in your hand? What have you got in your house? In faith, we say, Lord, yes. we got enough for yes. us and for many more. And in faith, we step out, and we say, Jesus... You're our supply. You're our source. Yes, and we don't see it, but we know that it's there in faith. And thank you, Lord, that you've always been faithful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. That was such an awesome scripture. Um, we can. It's very tempting right now to become more and more calculated with our lives and to be afraid of discomfort and afraid of extending ourselves and afraid of everything. And so it's so great that we're going to worship together. And that was such a great word that God just says, take what you have, give me that, and I will give you what you need. I will take care of you. And isn't that an awesome promise? Yes. yes. And, and just, you know, I know it's kind of weird to stand so far apart and everything, but Let's just, like, we are a family here. We're among family. Let's enjoy the Holy Spirit's presence. And we take our eyes off of our self-consciousness and all those self-absorbed ways that we all have, and we just direct our gaze to God, like, wow, He is the provider of everything we need. history. 
history can prove There's nothing you can do Faithful and true Though the storms may come And the winds may blow up Remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will not to pass Great is, great is your faithfulness To sing it out, church, great
out one more time, church. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your. Sing it again from the rising, from the rising sun to the setting. such a great word. Wow. Hallelujah. We just need to give him what we have in our house. We all have some vessel to fill. We have all of us something to fill with his provision, his spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We we're going to sing one last song before Ben comes to speak. And we're going to sing this out, this scriptural blessing that God gave Moses. When we sing it, we sing it to each other. And we claim it for our own families. Think of all those that we are claiming this morning for the Lord.
your children, and your children, and your children, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations, your family, and your children, and their children, and their children.
here to meet each one of us. That you want to be revealed to each one of us in new ways and deeper ways. Maybe for the first time. You want to be with us as we look into your word. And we take encouragement and we take faith from your word. Uh, let these be seeds that grow into great trees that supply shade and shelter for the world around us. In Jesus' name. Right, you may have a seat. One thing I'm really hopeful of this morning is that this we're having church in here. And I'm just hoping that this is translating uh, to the room next door, our, uh, our satellite church, as I like to call it, or our campus. Um, they're just back there. Uh, but I'm hoping that you all in live stream uh, in our overflow are having church. And if you're at home, I want to welcome you along. I want to talk this morning on the life and times of one of my, my favorite Bible characters. It's Gideon. Uh, you probably some of you are familiar with this, this man. Uh, and probably a lot of us can relate with this man. He's a guy who didn't really know himself. He didn't really see himself as someone with a lot of potential. And I find that relatable. Um, I don't know if you do, uh, but I certainly do. Um, I, I love that God calls him. God basically picks out of the whole nation of Israel the least likely to succeed in high school. Um, he picks him while he's in hiding. Not a very brave soul. But God sees something else inside him and picks him. He picks Gideon. God picks Gideon for uh, like God's biggest job at the time while he's an idol worshiper, while he's in total sin. God picks him. And I love Gideon's response, which is basically the only way I'm doing this is if you go with me. I'll try to fix this really quick. Um, I do love all the calls, all the callings in the Bible. I love when Noah's called and when Abraham's called and Moses and Joshua. I love when all the disciples are called because we just see the power of Jesus at work. Like, what would that be like to have Jesus walk up on you? Wouldn't you just drop everything and say, that seems like a good idea to go with this guy? And he says, come, follow me. That's what we see the disciples doing in Scripture. Um, we all are called. We're all called to follow Christ. We're actually all called to lead in our Christianity. As soon as you answer the call to follow, you become a leader and example for all those who are to come in the future, all those younger than you in the faith. God calls us to follow first, follow Christ, but also to lead and then we become that salt and light that the world needs whenever things get dead and dark. Our job as followers is to point the way to a better kingdom and to a better king than uh, what we're experiencing here in the natural. So we're all called in this general sense. And I want to look at Gideon because I wonder if some of you watching internet or in the other room or in this room might be called to something a little more specific. There's a general call that every Christian is called to God, to Christ, to follow, to lead. But sometimes there's a more specific call. Um, you might be called to one person who needs to come to Christ. You might be called to uh, Whitehorse as a community to bring faith and, and glory to God. Um, you might be called to a, a job of some sort. We had a we had someone who was called to come by a little while back. Uh, he was from it was then called New Tribes Mission. Uh, it's now changed to Eth, Eth, Ethnos or Enthos 360. Um, he was a missionary, uh, and he he was sharing just how much the world needs the light of Christ. He was working in places as a missionary where. We got a phone call. 
just a minute. <laughs> um, so he was working in a place that one of the beliefs was that the water had evil spirits in it. So if a woman became pregnant, she should not drink any water. Now, I believe that's a demonic teaching, basically. I believe that that concept comes from dark places. And that was not the worst of it. But you could imagine, if anyone here has, any of the women here have been pregnant, uh, you sometimes get craving. Now, imagine not being able to drink water. That is a demonic, a demonic uh, thought, isn't it? And, of course, the baby needs water. So this is an anti-human belief. And there's, all, and there's also the fact that his life was in danger the whole time. Some of these people groups are not governed by, by court systems and, and police and, and, and laws and regulations that are designed to be humane. So there's always a chance that their life could be over just like that. And often, I think, when God is calling us, it is to something we don't feel qualified for, we don't feel adequate for, we don't feel just like Gideon, like we're prepared. And so these are the things I love about Gideon. Um, and this is, this is basically the point in Scripture. Every time God calls somebody, look at what... Um, God says in Gideon chapter 7 and verse 2, God says this to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give to the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel should boast over me, saying, stop popping my peas and stuff. Okay, uh, Judges chapter 7 verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So Gideon becomes the perfect character for God to use. He's the, he's the most humble, weak man you could imagine. And when God is calling us to something, it's to do basically two things to bring glory to his name and bring people into his kingdom, to bring souls into an everlasting relationship with him. And so being called and leading in the kingdom is supposed to point everyone back to God, turn hearts back to the Father. The whole Bible from start to finish is this story of God trying to get man's heart turned back toward him. So if, you're, if you can relate with Gideon, if you're like Gideon in any way. Okay, my debut on Bethany Livestream. Hi, everyone. I might be back sometime, maybe not. Um, I do kind of miss, when, when we were doing pre-recorded services, uh, Pastor Joel bought this teleprompter, and man, that was great. Just, <laughs> everything is just right before you. Um, so, a little out of practice here. It's been six months or so. Um, we're turning hearts back to the Father. That's what we're doing as we're called, right? Okay. Um, and okay, I believe that He wants each one of us because I know you're all very humble people, and that's perfect. In Proverbs, it says, "God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble." So, uh, let's look at the life of Gideon really quickly. Um, Gideon's Gideon lived in a time uh, called, that is known as the time of the judges. So this is before Israel had kings. This is right after they've come out of Egypt. They'd have one judge to rule them all. So it started with Moses. 
and then it got passed down to Joshua. And then through the book of Judges, we meet different, different uh, people who come up into leadership and they, they t have a turn at leading Israel for a time. And we see this cycle in Judges. In fact, the whole book is a cycle. But we see this cycle of, it's not a good cycle, by the way. It starts with apostasy. So people begin ignoring God. They begin turning to other false gods. They begin looking to idols made with wood and metal and stone and putting their hope in those sorts of things. And then what happens is God allows something called servitude, where he allows another nation to come and take over Israel. He allows them to be crushed for a little while until they do what is known as supplication. They pray and seek God's help. They ask for a savior. And the final part of this cycle, at the, I don't know if it's at the bottom or the top, but God sends a savior to save Israel, to restore peace, to bring them back into uh, their own nationhood. And then the cycle begins over again. And so we find Gideon at the, basically the end of a cycle of servitude. It's been seven years of terror. And um, I don't know if you've ever felt that cycle in your own life, but I think it's a very human thing. Uh, there's one old preacher uh, that I read, and he said, they did evil in the sight of the Lord, may be written across the history of most suffering and sadness. This is the taproot of much of our suffering and inconvenience. As we fall away from God, we fall away from his blessing, the pain of which drives us back to God. So, this is a very simple formula, I believe, that is usually true of us. And the whole trick, I'm going to be really bold and say I've sorted out life. Um, the whole trick is to learn not to fall away from God. To stay in his light, in his presence, uh, stay with him, and then you don't have to fall into servitude. So that's what we're going to see in the life of Gideon here. Uh, the story picks up in chapter 6 of the book of Judges. It says, the, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of, the, of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of their land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. I was sharing this with the youth group, and I said, if you don't know what a locust is, imagine you're out in the, in the wilderness on a just kind of a bit of a damp day and all the black flies and mosquitoes. Midian's coming up like that against Israel. That was supposed to be semi-funny. Okay. <laughs> I guess it, it's not funny when it's happening to you. <laughs> uh, both they and their camels could not be counted, so they laid waste to the land as they came in, and Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out, for help to the Lord. So this is the whole cycle of apostasy, servitude, and then um, supplication with the last thing, we need a savior. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And we all just love how God calls him, not by his current state, as someone who is hiding, someone who has been hiding for years, someone who is afraid and feels weak. He calls him by his future, by all the potential that God knows he placed inside him. And Gideon said to him, said to the, 
said to him, Please, Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? That's the key to all victory, that God is with him. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Now, I'd just like to paraphrase what happens next. Um, Gideon is asked, asked for many signs. Uh, this time, he, as he asks for a sign, he, he's going to go and make a gift for this amazing being uh, that is called um, the angel of the Lord. He wants to make a present for him. He, so he prepares an offering. This is something he's used to doing. This is something that we'll see he's used to doing for false gods even. Uh, so he, he slaughters a goat, he makes some broth, he bakes some bread, and uh, he brings out this present. So this all takes time. Uh, Gideon sets it on a rock, and the angel touches it with his staff. Fire comes out and consumes his gift. And so this should serve as a sign. Okay, I am speaking with God, essentially. I'm speaking with his messenger, and that's just as good. Uh, so it should be, it should be all a man needs to go, to go out into battle for God, right? This is his first miracle. Um, but God is calling Gideon to something pretty insane. As, you, as we just read, the, the Midianites and Amalekites, they're swarming the land. He can't even, uh, prepare food in the open like he normally would. They would... They would thresh their wheat in the open so that the wind would blow away the chaff and they would just be left with grain on the ground. He's, he's, he has to hide to do that. And it's because of seven years of loss, seven years of, of terror that he, he's doing it that way. So Gideon wants a lot more assurance than just one miracle. Because after all, it could have been a dream. It could have all been a dream. You know, just because there's blood on the ground where he's slaughtered the goat and flour on the counter. Maybe he just had a weird thing in his mind. Who knows? Um, and this is what's relatable about Gideon. Is that he, he's, he's not quite sure God is with him. And he says, if I'm going to do this, i got to know you're with me. The fire-breathing rock is good, but I need more. Um, so, uh, the, the final thing that... Uh, sign he gets from God is, is God sends him to sneak up into the enemy's camp. So they're, they're encamped in this valley, an uncountable army, it says. And he sneaks up, and he's listening to a conversation. And one of them says to the other, I had a dream that a loaf of bread rolled into our camp and knocked over our tent, turned it upside down. That's Gideon's sign. Would that be a good enough sign for you? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to be able to defeat this uncountable army with whoever I can gather from Israel. Uh, yeah, that's a strange sign, um, but it gets stranger with Gideon's signs still. Um, he, he ends up with five in total that, well, if you count seeing the angel. Um, but the main signs we remember from Gideon's story are that he put out fleeces, now, this is a phrase that was new to me coming to Bethany. I'd never heard it before, so I only, I had to, like, decipher from the context of the sentence it was said to me and what it meant. Um, but this is the story it comes from, is the story of Gideon. So, he's really not sure that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's going to give this vast army uh, into his hand, that God is going to fight alongside him and, and help him kill all these people, like, we're talking about a, a thousand to one odds, or ten thousand against one. Um, so he does what any one of us would do. He asks for a sign. He asks God to take his fleece blanket and make it wet in the night. Isn't that what you'd do? A sign from God? 
This is like a genie in the bottle moment. It's like you're asking God for a sign. What, what would you ask for? I would ask to fly or something. You know, there's times when God parted the sea or he, or he made the sun stand still in the sky or he healed somebody. There's all kinds of signs God, I don't know why Gideon chooses to make his blanket wet. It's quite funny, I think. <laughs> um, but God obliges him, even though it's against Mosaic law to test God, and he does it. Gideon goes to bed with his blanket out in the middle of the threshing floor, and he wakes up. Everything's dry, except his blanket is soaking wet. A miracle. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he thought, that wasn't the best idea. I should get a new sign. Um, so he says, I got an idea, God. I got another idea for a sign. How about you make everything wet except my blanket? So <laughs> I find this hilarious. Uh, and God, miraculously, there's dew everywhere, and he picks up his fleece blanket, and it is completely dry. It's a miracle. So now Gideon knows he can go up against this vast army, and he does so. And uh, this, is, this is the way it ends. He is successful in rooting out uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites from the land of Israel. He, he grants Israel 40 years of peace. And his army actually gets chopped down to only 300 men. And it's one of the interesting things in the story is that God tells him to let everyone who is afraid to fight this army go home. You got 1,000 to 1 odds or 10,000 to 1 odds. Do you want to fight? Or do you want to, you can go home if you want. That's, that was actually a Mosaic law, that they were allowed to send home anyone who was afraid to fight. Because I guess fear must be like COVID. It's, it, it spreads. It's <laughs> contagious. Yeah. That's uh, just an aside. Um, so yeah, Gideon grants Israel 40 years of peace through this victory. Actually, God does it. Uh, Gideon is mistaken for doing it and sets himself up as judge, who acts like a king. Um, and, and then he actually ends up back where this all started with idol worship again. That's the topic for another message. Um, there's something in this story that I want to point out, though, especially. Um, and it's something that preceded this victory, and I think it's the key to all the good parts of the story, to Gideon's victory, to everything he did in faith and in strength and in power. Uh, to his whole change. Um, and in chapter 6, starting in verse 25, it says this. The Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has. This is how we know Gideon was probably an, a regular idol worshiper, probably breaking God's law on the week, every week. It's because it's in his father's home. The whole family would be involved in this idol worship. And, and he says, And cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord God, your God on top of the stronghold here, with the stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Now, two things I do want to point out really quickly. Um, the, the town does get uh, riled up against him. They want to kill Gideon. But his father just lays out a logical uh, idea. He says, hey, if, if Baal's a strong god, he'll deal with Gideon. So let's just see what happens. So Gideon has uh, backup with his dad, and he gets to go on to fight. And the second thing is the Asherah pole, which is mentioned twice, is interesting. So Asherah was a Canaanite goddess who was, uh, they, her mythology is that she was set up alongside God. They were married. They had 70 baby gods. Baal was one of them. And so we know that Israel was getting into this polytheism, getting into this anti, there's one God. Uh, behold, your God is one. It's like they're going totally away from the Ten Commandments. And, and everything that their, their nation is built upon. And so this is a key moment in Gideon's life. He went from someone who was loosely connected with his culture, with the idea that 
that God is, is up there somewhere uh, and worshiping all kinds of gods and, and trying to have better crops by worshiping other gods and trying to have his family through other means than the one God. And he had a total switch. He cut off all of that stuff in his life. He literally cut it down. It's a, a wooden pole and he burned it. And this is, this is where we should be relating to Gideon the most, I believe, is that when we want to get involved in the work of God, when we're inspired or called to do something for God, the first thing is to cleanse our lives of these kind of idols that can get set up. And they get set up in different ways. Some people, uh, like especially right now, are just working on their online status, who they are online. It becomes an idol in their life. It's a total focus. It is, it is, it is maybe greater than God in some people's minds. Some people are, they, they get caught up in, in money and thinking that's their security, uh, not knowing it's a tool to be used from God, but looking at it as an idol to be Worship to be sought after, to spend all of your energy going after. All these different kinds of gods get set up in our lives. And I believe most of us who come to faith in Christ, we immediately, this is what I did, I immediately wanted to start sharing what I found with other people. I immediately wanted to, to go out in battle for God, like I'm sure Gideon did. He's had seven years of torment, seven years of of being under the thumb of another people. And all he wants to do is, is rise up, be free, be able to live his life, but he hasn't been able to. And he's realized that there's things in his life that are holding him from doing that. So when God says, cut down the Asherah pole, destroy that altar to Baal, he goes out, he does it, and from then on, we see a new man. We see someone who is totally focused, unafraid, no matter the odds against him. We see him being okay with losing most of his army. He went from 32,000 men, fighting men, down to 300 men. Either way, it was not enough people to, to go against this battle. So we see God totally change him. There's something in his mind and his heart that changed when he cut out these idols from his life. And I think that's the call of Gideon. I think that's a call for all of us today. We're living in crazy times. I, like What's happening right now is unprecedented. We look all around the world and there's all kinds of darkness, there's all kinds of chaos erupting. Um, we don't know yet what the repercussions are going to be from everything we've done as a country uh, with, our, with our budgets. But my guess is that there's going to be ministry opportunities. There's going to be battles for each one of us to fight, whether it's if it's in our own family or it's in our community or it's a, something abroad where people need help and it opens the way for the gospel. I believe there's a lot we can take from Gideon, um, and especially this one moment where he breaks down the altar, he cuts down the Asherah pole, he completely destroys it, he cleans up his whole life, he cleans up his home life first. Um, Jesus said it this way in Luke 6.42, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your, out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Or um, there's uh, Canada's most famous uh, professor these days, uh, Jordan Peterson, he says, to paraphrase him, don't try to straighten out the world when your bedroom is a mess. So we've got some homework to do, and then we get to do the adventure thing with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but that's something I'm looking forward to, and I think it's something that can happen at any, any time. Whether you're in hiding, whether you're living in sin, whether you're uh, just new to the faith, 
God is going to interrupt your life and call you to do things for him that bring glory to his name and people to his kingdom. I think that's probably a great note to end on. So I'll ask the worship team to come up and we'll, we'll pray. We'll pray together. I want to pray uh, for, for you and everyone watching in, in regards to this message. And uh, we'll close with a song. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the gift of salvation, for the gift of hope. We thank you that you're concerned about each of our lives. And I pray for each one here in Bethany, here watching along with us in the overflow, here watching online, I pray that you would be speaking to hearts and minds, that you're calling them. You have work planned out for them, predestined that you want them to walk in from before they were born. You have good works for each one to do. And we just pray for faith and hope and love to fill hearts and minds today and for the future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and worship together with one last song. Mercy.
Lord, you found me, you healed me. 